this talk is uh, is a version of a talk that I originally was asked to give to um, internal medicine. So um, it's a basic talk and I decided to leave it like that. I think there are multiple different topics within this talk that could definitely be a presentation in and of themselves. And they, they are slash will be with our arthroplasty curriculum. Um, so look for more details, but this is just sort of kind of a, a broader strokes overview of arthroplasty. If you look at this here, um, you certainly see the spine fusion. Some of you, I'm sure your eyes go straight to that. Um, and then uh, bilateral total hip arthroplasty, then it kind of looks like the right hip is dislocated. Um, but if you look a little bit further, um, it's actually not so much dislocated as the uh, femoral head, the femoral component had eroded through the polyethylene through the metal and then was sort of um, embedded and lodged superior to the acetabular component. Um, this was a gentleman who presented with hip pain and um, everyone thought, well, you already had your hips replaced, so it can't be your hip. And he had that huge spine surgery, thinking it was some sort of a ridiculous situation. I'm sure he had spine pathology as well, but he kept complaining of the same hip pain and leg length discrepancy through his spine surgeries. This was one of my very first patients at OHSU, and indeed he had just eroded through his ethylene and eroded through his cup and he had a, a just a, a terrible mess of metallosis and failed joint replacement. Um, so, and I, I showed that picture to the internist because I was making the point that even if they've had their hip replacements, their hips still can hurt. It's not our goal. It's not what we want, but please take people seriously. Let's see. I, okay. Um, I don't feel very funny these days, but uh, I did find a couple of little jokes. I like this one. What fits your busy schedule better, exercising one hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? Okay, so the outline of this talk, this is another patient of mine at OHSU from um, my first few years in practice here. So the outline of this talk is first, we'll just kind of define what the problem of failing joints is. We'll identify modes of failure of joint replacements and there'll be some cases and examples um, and while we go through those, we'll also discuss what our surgical goals are at the time of surgery. I think that's one unique feature of revision arthroplasty is we have these very consistent surgical goals that are that are important. Um, we'll also discuss the evaluation of these patients as well as the diagnosis, and we'll go into um, a little bit about prevention. So, okay, the first problem he have is volume. The first hip replacement was done um, in around the year 1960, first knee replacement a little bit after that. And, and now there are over 400,000 hip replacements done in the US and over 700,000 knee replacements. So tons of people with these uh, procedures and living with these implants in our communities. The second problem is that we have an aging population. So in 2012 percent of Americans were over the age of 65, but by 2030, that's going to be just about 20 percent of Americans will be over the age of 65. Expectancy in the U.S. is just over 78 years, which interestingly is a little lower than Canada and the U.K. Um, and other places. So we certainly are the leader in life expectancy, but people are living longer. Uh, the next problem compounding all of this is obesity. People are getting heavier. And, uh, you know, certainly the res most of the residents know that you see a lot more than just the bones on the x-rays. You see the soft tissue shadows as well. So when you, before you go in to see this patient in clinic, you know that there's, there's more going on here than just um, knee arthritis. And these are just very common images we see every day. Um, this, is, this is a little bit fun. Um, I put this in a couple of different talks over the years. So this is the um, obesification of the United States between 2000 and 2010. I couldn't find the updated decade of it in this kind of pictorial form. So the the, the brown and blues are um, as you as you get away from I guess light blue, so darker blue, and then into this kind of orange color, people are getting heavier. It's the percentage of patients who are obese in the U.S. Oh, we have to add um, a, a new color, lots of orange now, and we have to add another color red. Oregon is flipping between orange and yellow, oh, and then we lose Colorado. So the whole the whole country is getting heavier, um, and uh, that, that doesn't make our uh, case, our volumes lower or our surgery simpler. 
Um, regarding arthroplasty in these obese patients, there's certainly a lot published, and these are just kind of some classic articles just um, looking at that are demonstrating a higher complication rate. So, obese, morbidly obese patients who have knee replacements, 22% of them in this series have wound complications, 10% with infections, and 8% with ligamentous injury um, at or after the time of surgery. And then looking at hips, um, again, we're just looking at what percentage of our patients um, are obese, and over a third of hips and over half of knees. If you follow these patients for a year um, in this study, um, they found that obese patients were, were younger and had higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of hypertension. None of that's a surprise, but their odds ratio of infection was uh, almost seven times higher in the knee patients and four times higher in hip patients. So absolutely increased chance of infection in this patient population. Again, nothing that you don't know, but the, but this is this is real. Also, when we look at how do people do, we do help people with uh, who are obese with hip and knee arthroplasty, but they certainly end up with higher or with lower uh, kind of knee functioning scores, um, as well as higher rates of complication. Joint replacements have inferior survivorship in obese patients um, and higher rates of revision. So all challenging things um, and make uh, our population uh, to take care of. Okay, so the next problem is implant longevity. These implants uh, don't necessarily live forever. So the average age of our patients who are having joint replacements is decreasing overall. Part of that's probably due to the obesification um, of our society. Then these, you know, these implants aren't going to live forever in everyone. And revision rates with modern bearing surfaces um, are improving, so it's a little ray of sunshine. Um, as our implants get better, our revision rates are decreasing, which is good. Um, and, and just to point out, there's no significant difference for hip revision rates um, on these different uh, bearing surfaces. So metal on highly crosslinked poly, ceramic on highly crosslinked poly, or ceramic on regular poly. Um, there was no difference in revision rates um, overall for those over time in a big um, uh, kind of meta-analysis level uh, paper uh, from 2015, and but superior than metal on standard polyethylene. Um, we don't use standard polyethylene uh, really very much anymore. Um, there isn't much reason to, but anyway, just so you know, we do have significant, um, uh, there are no significant difference in those revision rates. And now, um, revision rates with crosslink polyethylene are well below 1% a year, um, but they're above half of a percent per year per implant age. So if you so think of it this way, if your mom has a, a hip replacement at age 60, every year she has about half of a percent of a chance of needing a revision on that implant. That's kind of how I explain it to people. Um, and again, since the average age of arthroplasty patients is decreasing, this is just more and more people living longer. So the reason why implant longevity studies are hard, and I imagine um, that you can uh, can think this through if you if you spend some time doing it is that we're talking about these implants last decades, not years. So over decades, surgeons retire, research groups change, um, patients get lost to follow up, and patients pass away. There are very low events for these um, revisions. So since it is such a low rate, it really takes many, many, many patients to follow before you can really determine um, if one implant version lasts longer than another one. So just to get power, you need so many events that it's just really technically difficult to do these um, studies. Then to compound this, we, many societies, including our own, have lack of, uh, of complete registry data or complete registry participation. So the countries that do we really rely on for finding out which implants had problems early, and that's really about the limitation of them um, and we hope that over time they help us figure out which implants are revised more than others and in decades two and three, which is really what we're considering now. Um, certainly we've had material science advancements, which has been great, which is um, we believe contributing to improved implant longevity. Um, so again, those are the rays of, of sunshine in this otherwise kind of um, big pile of work we have facing us. <clears throat> so this is a, uh, uh, kind of the joint replacement failure mechanisms, uh, and this is this is kind of how my my take of how this breaks down. You'll see other organizations of these concepts in other textbooks, but um, from my standpoint, these are kind of the common ways that joint replacements uh, break down. So, for certainly, we have osteolysis. 
Osteolysis is um, a topic that certainly could uh, have a whole talk to itself, um, maybe a little bit uh, more in depth than for this audience. So I decided to, to just do this overview talk, but certainly osteolysis is due to polyethylene wear, leads to loosening and can, can lead to massive bone loss. One um, certainly true fact about osteolysis is there's lots of testable concepts about osteolysis that exam. So we'll go through those in a little bit more detail. Um, next is, of course, uh, periprosthetic fracture, instability, component loosening, metallosis, and infection. Um, and we will go through um, each of those. So again, that, those, that's how those are the failure mechanisms. Dr. Schauble sees it. I know I'm, I'm maybe feminizing arthroplasty here by not having a sports reference, but I don't know. Does anybody get this reference? Um, is there my, my daughter and her best friend's Halloween costumes? Anyway, everybody's quiet. Um, if any of you have watched the show Glee, um, my daughter, Yana, there uh, is dressing up as Sue Sylvester, who is a, a kind of a sociopathic cheerleading coach. Anyway, it's a good show. Definitely on the lighter side for these trying times. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about osteolysis. So osteolysis is caused by polyethylene wear. Just that statement is something that wasn't known until sometime in the 19... Late 1980s or 1990s, so the end of the 20, 20th century. So when we actually figured this out, we were doing arthroplasties for many decades before we really actually figured out what this mysterious bone loss was. We can lead to component loosening. Okay, that's one of the big problems, but it also can lead to massive bone loss. Okay, so this is a slide that has a lot of testable material on it. So polyethylene osteolysis is the most common form of osteolysis. It can be. There can be similar processes caused by other particles, but we're going to focus on the most common form of osteolysis in this talk. Osteolysis is a histiocytic response to debris, and in this case, it's ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. That's our most common source. The rate of polyethylene wear needs to reach a threshold before this happens. That threshold is greater than 0.1 millimeters per year of wear as measured stereometrically, which we'll talk a little bit more about. The particle size needs to be small. So if the particle size is generally less than a micron in size and they're forming at a great rate of greater than 1.1 millimeters per year of the polyethylene, that's when we have a problem. Okay, those are the two factors we need to have this problem. Factors that increase polyethylene wear from the patient side are patients less than 50 years old male that have an increased activity level, and then component malalignment. Certainly polyethylene thickness of less than six millimeters is also uh, uh, associated. Steps uh, to, there's certain steps of osteolysis and how this occurs. First of all, we have that wear happening. Again, we talked about the particle size and the rate of the wear. Then we have macrophage activation, and this involves the cytokine secretion TNF-alpha. That causes osteoclast activation, and that leads to rank ligand mediated bone motion. Again, this is the overview, but these are the buzzwords to start getting in your head. When there's enough bone loss, that causes implant micro motion, which we know is painful. Then the debris dissemination um, causes a hydrostatic pressure, or the debris causes a hydrostatic pressure, which leads to the dissemination of the debris into pockets and cavities in the bone. Okay. Certainly, this is an asymptomatic process largely until there's significant swelling or micro motion in the joint, and it is a progressive kind of positive feedback cycle. What you'll see on x-rays is radiolucency. You've got to be looking for those in patients who have implants, really any patient who has an implant, but certainly patients who have an older implant. And um, the best way to measure this, and they'll test you on this too, is radio stereometric analysis with tantalum beads embedded on both sides of the polyethylene and then very carefully measuring the distance between the two. This is something we rely on researchers to do for us and implant in certain people's um, joints and follow those. So we really value those studies. Let's see, I have lost the ability to forward my slides because somebody is annotating. I don't know how to change that. Let's see, there we go. Okay, so here's a case of osteolysis. This uh, gentleman walked into my clinic um, and we had the Beaverton 
Cornell West Clinic. He had had this hip replacement done in the 80s in Mumbai. He was an Indian gentleman and then later emigrated to the United States. Um, he worked in a mail room in the US standing all day and he'd had significant hip pain with a leg increasing leg length discrepancy for some time. He'd had this hip done as, as a young man for a fem displaced femoral neck fracture after he was uh, struck by a motor vehicle as a pedestrian. Uh, fascinating person, very, very high pain tolerance. Um, and so here, um, you see, he had this um, old school Charlie style um, cemented clean uh, component, and there is uh, certainly polyethylene wear. You see that the Charlie femoral head is migrating towards the top end of that little metal wire, um, and there, and then osteolysis surrounding the now dislodged cement. So. In this patient, um, our goals are a couple of things. One, we actually want to augment the bone. There's been some bone loss, so we'll often use bone graft. So augmenting bone is one of the surgical goals of hip revision surgery. And then we want to provide this patient with a stable implant. And we want to restore a hip center of rotation as well as leg length. Okay, so that stable implant to enable immediate weight bearing is, um, is one of our consistent arthroplasty goals you're going to be hearing. Okay, moving on. Now we're going to talk about fracture. So certainly we see periodic fractures in the elderly and in particular in the female. Increasing age and female gender are two of the um, uh, risk factors for periprosthetic fracture. So um, those are two testable things that we've all seen on tests. Uh, this gen gentleman was a nonagenarian at the time of taking care of him. Um, he would be over 100 years old now, though he is not still with us. So this is one of the elusive, I know you guys have been thinking about and talking about Vancouver classification. This is one of those kind of rare and controversial Vancouver B1 fractures where we believe the stem is stable and um, still fixed to that proximal bone. In this case, we uh, try to leave the implant, although unless you have a nice long oblique fracture like this, the stress riser at the end of the stem ends up being um, a thwarting factor to healing. In this case, we got away with some cables, could let this gentleman weight bear immediately. Um, we chose not to exchange his polyethylene because he did not seem to have significant osteolysis, and this was an urgent case. We did not have the implants available, and at his advanced age, uh, we took that gamble. So again, surgical goals here are to provide, provide stable fixation and enable immediate weight bearing for this elderly gentleman. Um, here's another example of a periprosthetic hip fracture. This is um, what happens when, when you fall on these cementless wedge type stems as they really explode the femur as they drive down into it. Um, so I think this is a really good depiction of that. Have just having a press fit versus a cemented stem increases your chances of um, periprosthetic fracture. We think there's a lot of different ways to look at this, but it seems that the risk factor over time is higher if you have a press fit stem. Certainly, press fit stems provide us certain other advantages, but periprosthetic fracture prevention is not one of them. This is a Vancouver B2 fracture. As you can see, the stem has subsided, so it's no longer fixed to that proximal bone that is then splayed apart as the stem's been pile driven into the femur. And that's kind of nice for us. We love Vancouver B2s. Those are fun fractures to fix because the stem comes out and then we have a femur to reconstruct and we do so around an intramedullary, um, uh, you know, long stemmed diaphyseal fixing device with then cables. This patient, again, is able to weight bear fully after this procedure, one of our main goals of arthroplasty revision. So periprosthetic fractures, as you saw from the last case, and I know that Jamil just talked about this, so we don't need to go into too great a depth on this one. You all just saw um, his really nice case presentation. This is a very similar fracture. Um, when you guys are learning how to ream the acetabulum and how to impact an acetabular component, um, this is what can go wrong if we are aggressive. Um, you can um, break through the quadrilateral plate and uh, protrude your acetabular component. This patient had a, a little bit more of a protracted course, but had been like this for many months by the time I met her. And um, we had a failed uh, column reconstruction with a jumbo cup. 
that's in between these two pictures that I didn't put on the top. And she ended up actually with a custom triflange um, component. So the custom triflange component is made specifically for this patient based on CT um, reconstructions showing where her bone loss specifically is, and then we can add some metal. Nice things about custom triflange component is they can have an ingrowth surface. Um, we still did plate the posterior column in addition to using this custom triflange. Not that we expect the column necessarily to heal, though we hope it does, but also just to stabilize the pelvis so that we can get fixation and hopefully some ingrowth and increased longevity with this implant. Surgical goals here, we want to augment her bone stock. She lost a lot of bone, so we put a ton of bone graft behind this custom component, hoping that we can actually get bony union um, across her columns, or at least maybe her anterior column. Then we have a plate stabilizing posterior column and the custom triflange. Her stem actually just stayed the same. We want her to be able to immediately weight bear. We want to restore leg length and hip center of rotation. And then again, lastly, increasing bone stock. Um, she called me several years after this with um, with leg pain, and I have, she's from Southern Oregon. Her husband's actually a Shriner, like one of the guys with the hats. And I had him drive right up, and I was worried. I was worried. I was sweating it. I was like, oh, no, what are we going to do now? And she had a rip-roaring radiculopathy when I met her, and it wasn't her custom triflange. It was actually um, a disc herniation, and she did well with conservative management of her spine. Thank you, team spine. Um, okay. So some, some patients present with multiple failure mechanisms all in one. So this is a gentleman who presented to an outside busy orthopedic practice here in town in May, on May 11th um, years ago with pain just below his left knee. He had these knees replaced 20 years ago. He loved his knees, but he was having pain just below that left knee. The astute observers are, are seeing what the problem is here um, that he had heart disease. He had some, he was a smoker. He wasn't a good surgical candidate. That group said, sorry, we can't take care of you. You're too sick. Sent him on his way. He had increasing pain, eventually lost the ability to ambulate. And three months later, I evaluated him in my clinic with this situation going on, a periprosthetic fracture just below the tip of this 20-year-old uh, TKA stem. Again, this gentleman now comes to me in a wheelchair, non-ambulatory. Um, worse off. So again, look at, look at May here. I'm going to go through these one more time just so you can see, and where he ended up in 11. So if you if you can tell here, um, we've got this osteolytic lesion here that was able to track down this longer stem component and form with very thin polyethylene and a component that you know is decades old. So to fix this again, we want this guy to be able to weight bear right away. But now we've got an osteolytic fracture completed in the tibia, as well as a failed um, old arthroplasty. So in this case, we revised the knee, but then I also put a, a plate with as much compression as I could um, on the side. And again, because there's some cement proximally, I'm not sure I really could compress. But anyway, I was trying to um, borrow some of the trauma principles for this gentleman. He um, ended up healing and doing OK, but he did have some post-operative medical and wound healing complications uh, after this procedure. And he, there's his, there's his, I think, united osteolytic fracture, which was exciting because I wasn't sure if it would heal. Okay, this is something near and dear to residents' heart is um, instability. Joint replacements absolutely can fail due to instability. The common causes of instability are component malalignment. That's answer one, two, and three on your exams, um, tissue, and in your mind, um, then tissue damage or tissue loss, either iatrogenic. Um, from prior surgeries, or it can be from things like infections or pseudotumors. And then lastly, patients can have unstable components due to patient factors, things they're doing um, that are sabotaging their own joint replacement. Um, here's an example of a instability of a knee, actually, a component that failed due to malalignment. This joint wasn't stable and was biomechanically disadvantaged from, uh, from um, the tibia component being placed in varus, and over time that component just kept moving um, and became loose, stable. And so our surgical goals in this case are to augment the lost bone, restore alignment, and again, as always, provide an ability for immediate full weight bearing.
So here's a case of instability uh, contributed to by polyethylene wear. This is again an old hip replacement done many decades ago. You can see that that alumina ceramic femoral head is starting to migrate towards the top of the cup. It is no longer concentric. That's your indication of some um, polyethylene wear. Um, certainly some osteolysis both on the femoral and acetabulum sides, though not, not extreme. This patient started dislocating after after many years of having a functional hip replacement. And due to elderly age and abductor loss at the time of the surgery, he was uh, a constraint liner was used to fix this, but new polyethylene that was cross-linked. And to loosening as another failure mechanism of joint replacements. This can be either in the presence or absence of infection. It can be to the failure of bony ingrowth. It can also be a problem with a cement mantle and cemented implants. So there's this takes multiple forms, implant loosening. Here's an example of a patient with um, a hybrid knee replacement uh, where the femoral component was cemented and the tibial component was press fit. If you look at that upper film on the uh, right, the lateral, you see a femoral component that looks to be well fixed to bone. And then if you look down over time, the component has flexed. And there's been some bone loss um, underneath it. That's an indicator of a loose femoral component. Um, and given the patient's ongoing pain, um, this was not a tricky diagnosis. And so he went on to a full re revision. Um, that press fit tibial component is actually really difficult to get out because of those giant plugs that are made out of um, you know, very much so in growth metal. Uh, so in this case, getting those out is very tricky. Uh, so we want to minimize bone loss in the case of knee revisions. We want to restore the center of rotation of the knee as well as provide uh, ligamentous stability and constraint when necessary and enable immediate weight bearing. Let's talk about metallosis. Um, certainly there are several reasons we can have metallosis in a hip, but the big one hopefully um, is something that we're going to see less and less over time as we re revise metal on metal um, articulations in joint replacements. Um, also, we can see metallosis from modular junctions in stems, in particular modular neck um, stems. So make sure you leave this program being able to identify a modular neck femoral component on x-rays. We'll make sure you see that. We'll point it out whenever we see them. Um, also, trunnionosis, well, just the junction between the stem and the head of the implant, especially if it is a titanium stem and a cobalt chrome head. Um, so uh, delving into this a little bit more, metal on metal uh, articulation really ended up being a giant can of nasty, nasty worms that was open to the orthopedic community and into our society, what people had to go through. Um, there's a little bit on the history of where metal on metal bearings came from. So in, like I said, in the late 20th century, we figured out that polyethylene, uh, <laughs> polyethylene where it leads to osteolysis. So they're kind of knowing that that Plastic wearing out is what made joint replacements wear out appropriately. The thought was, well, how can we make this better? So there kind of were two trains of thought. Team A said, okay, well, let's make polyethylene better. And team B said, well, let's get rid of poly altogether. And that concept of getting rid of polyethylene and joint replacements is what led to the concept of hard on hard bearings. And if you call plastic soft, um, metal would be hard, ceramic would be hard. So the two hard on hard bearings were metal on metal. If you want to see more about that from kind of a, a layperson's standpoint, watch The Bleeding Edge. It's a documentary about actually about an orthopedic surgeon who had a metal on metal hip failure. Um, and it's, it's interesting. It's not maybe uplifting. So if you're feeling anxious or stressed out in these times, maybe save it for a different day. Um, but it really demonstrates what kind of a public health crisis this metal on metal um, bearing concept trial led to. Um, ceramic on ceramic is the other hard on hard bearing, which has had some, uh, some muted successes um, uh, and definitely wasn't quite the catastrophe that the metal on metal was. And then the other team, Team A, wanting to make polyethylene better, they're the, they came up with highly cross-linked polyethylene for the win. Um, so about metallosis. So if there's no polyethylene, do we have the holy grail? Joint replacement's going to live forever. Metal on metal, no plastic. The wear debris, though, there's always going to be a wear debris. Whenever you have a bearing surface, there's going to be a wear debris. There's going to be wear debris. Remember that. That's just logical. I was a history major in college, not an engineer, but that makes sense to me. Um, wear debris is going to be metal ions. 
So these metal ions cause all sorts of problems, and they've been described in different ways over the years, but there's been a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. So hypersensitivity to the metal was one problem. Another problem was that these adverse local tissue reactions would occur, and these alveol or acute lymphocytic vasculitis and associated lesions would also occur. So this is more of a lymphocytic process rather than a histiocytic process, which is what osteolysis is driven by. And what could happen is there'd be massive pseudotumors or massive tissue loss um, in people's joints. Happened to women more than men, and these failure rates were as high as 10 to 30 percent in patients who were closely followed. Um, implant recalls from several companies ensued. People had extremely high levels of serial cobalt and chromium levels, leading to end organ damage concerns, as well as some concern for cellular aneuploidy. Um, these led to lots of revision surgeries. Often the diagnosis was um, confounded with infection, so people would have two-stage exchanges when really all they needed was a bearing surface exchange. Absolutely, lawyers got involved, and there was hundreds of millions of dollars paid out in class action lawsuit settlements. And what the, one of the th uh, really important outcomes of this is we realize how crucial national registries, careful, thorough, complete national registries are, because we got the early flags of this problem from UK and Australia and other countries that have um, fairly robust national registries. And it is from here that the AJRR US registry um, concept really um, came into full swing and was born and um, more about that later too. So, um, Here's a, a case of metallosis, kind of an interesting one. This is a well-functioning gentleman who had a hip replacement five years ago, metal on metal, and he was doing well. He presented with a groin mass and scrotal retraction to my clinic, and I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't know that this is my area of expertise, but I calmed down and just looked at him a little bit more carefully um, and I realized that he had significantly elevant, elevated cobalt levels. Mars MRI was demonstrating a pseudo tumor. And with his metal on metal articulation, it was pretty clear what we needed to do. So this green, um, this green tissue is really what it looks like when you have metallosis in in a wound. And um, we, any of you who've done many hip revisions, certainly have probably seen some degree of that. Um, but it's just really nasty. So after um, revision and debridement, changing his bearing surface, um, he's, this patient um, did well. Uh, okay. Moving on. Oh, I'm going to go back one more time talking about metal on metal. One one thing just to tell you all is that these metal on metal hip replacements still exist. It's sometimes it's hard to know based on x rays alone if the bearing surface is metal on metal. So, really, for all of us who are going to be seeing patients with failing joints or painful joint replacements, you always have to consider some degree of metallosis in your workup of patients. So, we'll discuss that again when we get to our workup. Certainly, infection absolutely could um, be a lecture and then some in and of itself. So, uh, we'll just go over some very basic concepts. Um, but here's a, a just a, a, to hallmark how complex these revisions can be. Or here's a gentleman, 50 years old, who had a bilateral metal on metal hips. Again, you put the quote new technology in all the young people, right? Because it's going to be the best, but it's not proven. Bilateral metal on metal hips in this gentleman who's obese. He has mental um, illness that he struggles with um, that is not well controlled. Um, he has a history of remote infection. Something happened after one of his first surgeries. And he presented to us with cobaltism, cardiac, and renal disease, and um, a medical team who drastically wanted us to revise his hip replacement. He needed a revision bearing, and we found him to have evidence of a recurrent infection. So, we had to get these extremely well-fixed components out of uh, this big gentleman. We found that the recurrent infection was the same, uh, the same bacteria. Uh, we assumed it was chronic. Uh, it was an... <clears throat> He had antibiotic intolerance, which made it more difficult. We certainly knew that there would have been a biofilm on that implant, given how long it had been in. So, therefore, we have to perform a two-stage revision, which is where we remove the well-fixed implants, place an articulating antibiotic spacer, or sometimes not an articulating antibiotic spacer, given the chance. But I will tell you, in this case, I definitely lost the battle with my ETO and getting this stem out. Um, he had significant bony loss, and you can see um, that there was a lot of lateral femur there. Uh, lost, um, but in any, in any case, this is what his one stage look like. Thankfully, um, the femur wants to be a femur and it kind of turns back into a femur if you give it a chance and you let it articulate. And he thankfully regrew with the femur that I lost. Um, and we had evidence of eradication of infection and it took a long time because of his antibiotic intolerances. And he went on to his second stage reimplantation of a. Long diaphragm fitting um, stem, 
and did not recur in his infection, thankfully, although he did about three weeks after surgery, decided he needed to crawl under his house to do some maintenance and he dislocated. Um, after a closed reduction, he went on to do okay. I haven't heard from him. Um, so when joint replacements are old and maybe failing, um, patients are gonna probably come complaining of pain or something. So you wanna figure out the history of their implant, where was it done, what is it, when when, and why. Why is actually important. Get as much information as you can. Sometimes this is decades ago and you can't get very much information, but get what you can. Uh, and then you wanna find out, did that joint ever work well? Was it functional for a time? When did it actually start to hurt? And is this pain the same as the pain they had preoperatively, if they can remember? And has there been any history at any point of a draining wound, patients needing antibiotics, a washout procedure being formed? You want to use all of these words for patients. Um, and that physical exam, certainly normal things like swelling, range of motion, and gait are important. X-rays, certainly weight-bearing X-rays, really need weight-bearing X-rays. You're not going to see that femoral head migration within the acetabulum and um, wearing out polyethylene if they're not standing. So you really need weight-bearing radiographs, looking for radiolucencies, alignment, and changes over time. Whenever possible, find their old X-rays and compare. Um, sometimes this requires a second visit. You have to get the X-rays, bring the patient back, look at them again. This is a nice thing about virtual visits is you don't have to bring that patient back to town. You can do a virtual visit with them once you obtain their second X-rays to go over findings of change over time. Sometimes we use nuclear medicine both to um, help us identify loosening or infection. And although although that's a study with limited um, utility, often the results are equivocal and the sensitivity and specificity. Um, are poor. Sometimes a Mars MRI, we say Mars, metal artifact reduction sequences. Really important to make that very clear when you're ordering it because otherwise you just get a, an MRI with um, scatter from the implants and not much utility. But if you ask them to suppress the metal artifact, you do get a better, better images. Lab work. We always want to get ESR and CRP. Any failed joint, really, any joint replacement someone's complaining of really probably deserves these labs. Um, infection can present in all sorts of ways, and so we want to um, we want to rule it out. And normal ESR and CRP practically does that for you. We also want to get serum cobalt and chrome levels, looking for metal on metal. When you have any degree of suspicion that they could have a problem with metal on metal, which should be most of the time, have the op report in front of you that they have a ceramic femoral head. Um, um, and that, you know, then the, the likelihood is very low. Then you consider aspirate based on the ESR and CRP. Aspirating a joint um, is important. Aspirating hips is tricky. It's, it's expensive and it's usually done under uh, radiological fluoroscopic guidance. Um, so it's something you really want to order only if you really think you're going to need it and it's going to change your, your decision making. Certainly you really want to get a cell count. Okay. And again, these depending on when the hip replacement was done, or if it was a knee replacement, these can um, these numbers change a little bit. But around 2,000 white blood cells, depending on when the joint was done, and if it was a hip or a knee, are going to be concerning for um, for infection in that uh, replaced joint. And then, if you can, if they get enough fluid, gram stain and culture um, are certainly also helpful. Again, those are things you guys know. Um, so kind of the, the concepts of how, how do we prevent, how do we talk to our medical community as well as our patients about, about co-management and prevention of these, these big difficult surgeries. We, need, we want our partners to refer these patients to us early. If a patient has a hip, painful hip or knee, we should evaluate it. If it does look like maybe it's a radiculopathy and not a joint replacement failure, then we can handle that um, referral process. But we want to make sure we take a look at these older implants right away. We want to get weight-bearing x-rays in labs. Those are all things that can be done on the primary care side. Um, prevention of catastrophic failure. Um, kind of questions this, this brings up is, should we be getting x-rays and having patients come in to see an orthopedist every five years? I tell my patients that's a good idea. It's certainly hard to enforce. And a lot of times is absolutely, you know, a very um, un interesting clinic visit. Um, we talk more about the weather um, and politics than we do about their joint. Um, but should we do this more frequently in these implant people for 15 years? These are all questions that don't have specific answers. We also want to encourage people to exercise. That's why we put these patients, these in people, but we want them to be low to medium impact, really to avoid things like running, jumping, mogul skiing. Um, 
to protect the polyethylene. And again, we just have very little biomechanical data about what high impact activity will do to implants. Also, you want to encourage people to maintain their weight. Again, first goal is to stop gaining and then weight loss. Meticulous patient optimization, of course, is very important. We got to avoid the medically uh, linked complications to whatever extent is possible and have people moving preoperatively to minimize chances of falling and suffering periprosthetic fractures. So, in general, summary slide procedures range in complexity um, from very simple, straightforward 20 minute liner exchange procedures versus complete overhauls that are really extensive. These surgeries require contingency planning. You need to know what you've got, what your options are. You need to have plan A's, B's, and all at the ready. Often you need specialized instruments um, and to know specialized techniques. Um, general anesthesia is often required, although sometimes um, we are cavalier and we do revisions when we're really confident that they're going to be simple under spinal anesthetic. Revision joint replacements are not minimally invasive. There's nothing minimally invasive about it. These are often get downs and we need to see what we're doing. There's scar tissue. We need to be very careful not to damage um, uh, neurovascular structures. Recovery is longer than primary joint replacements. Well, I well that given patients older than when they have their first for their first joint replacement. The mode of failure is um, often going to contribute to the longer recovery, as well as the more extensiveness of the procedure. We just are making bigger incisions. We're dissecting more tissue. So the diagnosis is certainly key in a revision. A revision surgery without an identified problem um, has about the success rates as getting a heads when you toss a coin and maybe not even that good. So we always need to have a diagnosis before the revision surgery is um, attempted. Complication rates are higher. You have to remind patients of this. These surgeries are more technically challenging. Uh, we're removing well fixed implants sometimes. Scar tissue obscures structures and tissue planes. There's often bone loss or we're dealing with bone loss and significant deformities. Patients are older, more frail and more medically complicated. So, from a prevention standpoint, that's always an interesting question. Now, we want to perform high quality primary surgeries. That's what we're trying to teach you guys here. And I think a lot of you, and most of you, are able to do that. So, we want you to go out into the workforce and perform high quality primary surgeries. We want to avoid technology trends and fads until data exists. That didn't happen with metal on metal. So, think about it. Is this new technology we need? Does it solve us a problem? And if, if the answer is no and probably not, then maybe just don't use it. Use it until we have those, those questions answered. Always medically optimize your patient to whatever extent is possible. Perform careful follow both early and late. Keep yourself um, available to patients who've had their surgery years ago and be willing to evaluate those people as well. Certainly follow the orthopedic literature um, and participate in joint replacement registries when you can, as well as follow outcomes research and maybe even participate in it. And this is my uh, historic slide, but it was still in this talk from when I gave it the first time in a different form. And uh, so these girls are 10 years older than this now. So um, that is, and hopefully their spelling got better. If you notice, squeezed is spelled S Q W E E S T, um, but maybe not that bad for a five-year-old. So um, that's that's my talk. Thank you guys for your attention. Those of you who paid attention, I hope that was a helpful over overview. And it is just approaching eight o'clock here. Certainly, if anyone has any questions, I would be. I'll stick around. Otherwise, have a great week. Uh, thank, thanks so much, uh, Dr. Trouble. Kenny Gundel here. Uh, I'm just curious in thinking about revision arthroplasty, how do some of the social economic uh, contributors to health that we're all aware of, how do they play into how you are thinking about and planning for or, or trying to avoid revision arthroplasty? Um, are you thinking about, to give me an example of maybe a a concern you're thinking about sure sure if like if somebody has like housing issues or substance use issues or um, it's kind of under resourced how, how, how do we help think about them or or help resource them for yeah, a that's successful a, that's a, revision that's a great question i think when you have something that's time sensitive and a progressive like osteolysis um i think there's an argument that those patients need to be you know we need to pull everybody pull together and get that person through as best as possible, certainly infections and uh, and osteolysis are in that camp. I, in a very controversial move, did a 
had minor exchange on a patient who was um, incarcerated because he really had significant progressive osteolysis. Um, and I definitely caught some flack for this, but um, uh, when when it's a more of a, a subtle failure or something that is less time sensitive, I still think that patient's optimization is crucial and including social factors. Certainly there's only so far we can get with some patients and, and you gotta meet patients in the middle oftentimes. So if you have someone with substandard housing but who has a really unstable joint replacement, for example, if there is a component malposition that you think can be improved, um, sometimes we will probably go after that in spite of um, the suboptimal social situation. So it's always a mix. It's This is what makes these cases um, hard is there's a lot of gray. And so you spend a lot of time in this workup and trying to optimize patients. Um, but often we have to accept less than perfect. Uh, whereas I think for our primary joints, we need to be a little bit more hard headed um, and try to push pay people closer to being reasonable candidates. Uh, so we have fewer of these revision conundrums. Thank you. That's a great question. And one that's only gonna come up more and more. Katie, I've got a question for you. Great talk, by the way. Thanks. Uh, one of the one of the things that I always struggle with is what uh, what do you do with somebody who's got an infected joint, uh, and uh, you you you've you know you've done all the things, you fixed that side, and then they want a replacement on the other side. How do you approach that, other than just you know sort of be necessarily wary, but you know, the risk is going to be substantially increased. So they've had, what was their complication on the other side? Well, you know, so they've gotten an infected joint on one side, you've addressed that yeah. you've, uh, you know, you've done your two-stage revision, they've done all their things. Now they're, now they're back and they're saying, Dr. Chauvel, let's do my left hip. Right. So that's a, I, I love those patients. That's a fun challenge. But, um, you know, when we, I like to engage the infectious disease community. Usually these people know ID because they, you know, they had to go see them for their two stage exchange. So I think usually um, either a visit or at least a conversation of, is there just anything else we need to do preoperatively? Sometimes we'll do things like, um, like decontaminate people's homes. Um, and there's these various different regimens and that shows a whole lot of science behind it. But um, if a patient has had a series of different type of skin bacteria type infections in their life, they'll do like a home decontamination where they, you know, do things like just give a real specific recommendation on, on cleaning bedding and um, skin baths and often partners have to participate in this. Anyway, um, we've done that before. Um, I think a lot of it is just reminding the patient that you're still the same patient and this happened to you once, so the risks are higher. That's just the conversation alone, I think is helpful. And um, you sometimes we consider putting people on prolonged oral antibiotics. Um, that is controversial, but there have been some some studies that show that that um, for high risk patients that that is a reasonable thing to do and can decrease prosthetic joint infections. So that's another thing that the infectious disease community doesn't like that though. So if you ask them if they think that's a good idea, they're almost always going to say no. So sometimes we just do it, say two um, to four weeks of an oral antibiotic uh, course postoperatively as a prophylactic regimen. Again, controversial, but definitely being studied um, in a patient maybe with some risk factors you can completely modify. Definitely dental clearance, making sure people really are, 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 their mouth is evaluated prior to doing this next joint replacement. Sometimes we forget to have people um, see a dentist before their first joint replacement, and that can be a con con contributing factor to PJI. So definitely dental clearance is another thing we'll add to their list. Yeah, yeah. I think that's an excellent point. Cool, great. Thank you very much for that talk. Thanks, Adam.